Let's see. Okay. Some disclosures. Most of this is drug safety work with a variety of companies uh, and government agencies around drug safety. So the, the drugs we're going to talk about are all up here, and you know all of them, so I'm not going to go through them or their mechanisms. But the ones in yellow, infliximab, adalimumab, and etanercept, you can see from, from Jack's data, most of our safety data with regards to infection comes from evaluations of those three drugs. They've been on the marketplace the longest. They've been followed the longest in uh, drug registries and population-based studies. For the other, uh, other drugs here of different mechanisms, and even the newer TNF-alpha inhibitors, we don't necessarily have good data. We have data from RCT and open label experiences, but not population-based data. Some of that is in process and will be out soon. I stuck uh, tofacitinib down here since it's uh, not really an other biologic. It's, uh, it's its own thing. It's a synthetic uh, non-biologic DMAR, and I'll talk more about the data emerging with TOFA. So quickly, the TB update. The good news here is in the U.S., as you know, our TB rates continue to go down. That's not the case everywhere in the world. Uh, the darker this map is, and I'm colorblind, so I can't really tell you much here, other than uh, the darker it is, the more TB there is. So we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and a few spots in South America. And that has been the TB epidemiology for a number of years. So of course, when you have patients coming from these parts of the world, uh, they're at high risk, just as Jack uh, had suggested in his talk. This is just the most recent data uh, from 2012, released uh, a couple weeks ago by CDC. And just to take you through this, uh, the dotted line represents the TB rate in foreign-born persons in the U.S., and it ends up right now about 15 per 100,000. The solid line is the rate in U.S.-born persons. It's almost zero. Uh, overall, the, the rate in the U.S. is, I think, 3.2 per 100,000, so it's quite rare. Uh, at this point. The, these bars show you what proportion of these cases are in foreign-born individuals. I think they're on the right, and on the left would be the U.S.-born individuals. So at this point, it's about 63 percent of all TB cases in the U.S. occur in foreign-born individuals. So clearly, in terms of your patients and their risk factors, if they were born in another place outside of this country, and I'm not talking Switzerland, but I'm talking that map where all the uh, darker uh, countries are colored. Uh, those, those patients are certainly at higher risk uh, for TB than, than patients born in Salem, Oregon, uh, like me. Actually, I was born in Minneapolis, but I grew up in Salem, so I'm a Twins fan. Sorry, Indian. Uh, TB pathogenesis. You guys don't need to read this slide. I just show this slide to remind myself to tell you that uh, this is an interesting bug. It's evolved with our immune system for thousands and thousands of years. It knows how to live with us, and it knows how to take advantage of us when we're down. And certainly, TNF blockade counts for being quote unquote down, and TB can take advantage of this. The nice thing about TB is when it comes into your lungs, it is engulfed by alveolar macrophages, and then spills, and there is this dissemination event that, that occurs briefly before the body essentially contains the infection. And it does so via a granulomatous response that was already mentioned. That response, of course, is dependent on interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, et cetera. But the point is, you can find on autopsy studies granulomas anywhere. You can find them in any organ, any part of the body. And this is why a good degree of these patients can wake up or their TB can wake up and, and they'll develop extrapulmonary TB, and uh, why, maybe, why that is more common in the immunosuppressed setting. So I need to hit hard on prednisone first. Uh, I don't like prednisone. I think it's a dangerous drug. I know that uh, some people use it in short duration, low dose use is probably fine, blah, blah, blah. However, the longer you use it, and the higher the dose you use it at, the more serious infections you have, as Jack just uh, talked about. But TB is clearly a risk factor for TB. We've done work showing it's a risk factor for non-TB mycobacterium. It's clearly a risk factor for, for PCP, and you can just go down the list. Uh, and this is really the most elegant study that was done recently in the UK using the practice uh, database. They're showing that uh, even at uh, average doses of less than 15 mg per day, so what we, we would consider low or moderate to low dosing, the, the relative risk of the odds ratio is about three. The, the risk is almost eight for people on uh, higher doses, and that's the risk for TB. So uh, I don't need to get on my soapbox anymore about prednisone, but I do encourage you to uh, limit your, your prednisone use. So how about the risk of TB? Jack showed some of this data. This is a, a table I created recently for a, a, a review article that, of a, for a journal Jack was editing. And uh, I just picked the three most recent population-based studies. These are done in non-TB endemic areas, so Western Europe and the U.S. 
I think it reflects most accurately, it's most generalizable to uh, our setting here and what we deal with. And I'll just take you through it. In the UK, they looked at TB rates overall with TNF blockers compared to non-biologic uh, comparators. And then they looked at the individual drugs. And they saw a rate of 95 for all TNF lumped together. But then at the individual drugs, you all know the story. The rates were higher with the two monoclonals, infliximab and adalimumab. The rates were three or fourfold higher than that seen with the Tanercept. The rate for a Tanercept was higher than that seen for, uh, for the non-biologic DMARDs. The rate was zero. And the background rate in the UK at that time was about 12. So the rates for, for all these drugs are elevated above background, but the monoclonals carry higher risk. The, the French did a similar study. They looked at uh, their, their database. They found 117 per 100,000, which was higher than their general population, although they didn't break this out by drug. We did a similar study in Kaiser, Northern California, uh, and we found this is the exact same thing that the UK did. Interestingly, our rates were all about half of what theirs were, which reflects the fact that our background TB rate is about half of what theirs is. We found a similar three or four fold higher risk in the two monoclonals as compared to a Tanercept. So why is there more risk with monoclonals? I don't have time or interest really at this point to go through all this. Uh, no, I have interest, but I don't want to. I, I don't want to bore you. I have about 20 slides on mechanism of action. So I, I plucked three of them just to highlight a few potential mechanisms of action. This was from Bob Wallace's lab, and when it was one of the early in vitro looks at this question, and clearly in a in a TB culture filtrate. Uh, assay, you can see that interferon gamma production is downregulated from T lymphocytes to a greater extent in, uh, in the cultures that were exposed to adalimumab and infliximab, whereas the Tanercept seemed to affect that interferon gamma production less. Hence the idea that perhaps the lymphocytes are less able to control TB uh, with uh, the monoclonal exposure versus the Tanercept. There was another study done by Joanne Plesner, which I liked very much. It was very interesting. This was uh, just to make it easy for you, this is an acute and a chronic mouse TB model. So the top A and B, this is the acute model. The bottom B, C and D is the chronic model. So an acute model of TB for mice means you buy a bunch of mice and you put them in a cage and spray a bunch of TB in the cage and they get it. And then they all die. So here it is. This is their survival curve. It didn't matter what the mice were on. Some of these mice were on a monoclonal. Some of the mice were on a fusion receptor, i.e. a Tanercept. And they gave all these people, uh, or people, these mice, an inhalational dose of TB. And within about 20 days, they all died. So the survival curve didn't look very, very nice. And when they did their uh, bacterial burden assays, they took the lungs out. They did necropsy. They found similar TB bacillary counts in all the organs. Didn't matter what drug you were on. Where they noticed the difference was the chronic infection model. So the chronic infection model is meant to simulate latent TB in humans. Does it? Not really, but it kind of does. It's essentially a low, uh, low level, slowly progressive, insidious, uh, persistent TB infection that's kept in check in the mouse. Uh, but what happened here was they gave this group the TNF blockers that were monoclonals. They gave this group the uh, Tanercept. And you can see that the monoclonal treated mice disseminated pretty rapidly and died. The, the ones that had a Tanercept tended to live 100 to 150 days and only 60% uh, or 40% died, 60% survived. And when they looked at the bacterial burden, they found much higher bacterial burden in the monoclonal treated uh, animals. So um, when they took a step back, and you don't need to read the top part because I already told you that, but the bottom line was this. Uh, when they dissected the granulomas from the lung and other places, what they found was a whole lot less etanercept in the granuloma. So it raised the idea that perhaps the etanercept doesn't penetrate the granuloma to as great an extent as the monoclonals did. Hence, perhaps, uh, the result would be a greater interruption of cell-cell signaling in the granuloma by a monoclonal. I, this hasn't been replicated, but it was an interesting idea based on this one study. And again, it's a mouse study. Uh, my last slide on uh, MOA is uh, Stefan Stanger's group in Europe. I like this study a lot. Basically, they just looked at infliximab, but it, it turns out that uh, infliximab, of course, as you know, tends to bind surface or membrane-bound TNF, uh, and uh, a Tanercep does not bind surface membrane TNF to nearly the same extent. And when you bind membrane-bound TNF, you actually downregulate the production of uh, certain CD8 cells, which produce these two things called perforin and granulysin. Perforin and granulysin are actual antimicrobial peptides that kill TB. It's one of your body's ways to actually 
uh, put a hit on a TV bacilli. And so the idea is that when you downregulate these, uh, these antimicrobial peptides, of course, you, you lose your ability to control TB. So they speculate that this may occur more often with infliximab uh, than, say, etanercept, but they didn't actually evaluate etanercept in the study. Okay, let's go to screening. Um, so the bottom line is all the TNF drugs cause TB, but I think there is greater risk with monoclonals. Sertilizumab, golimumab, we don't know. There, there's no comparative data with those drugs and the other drugs. One may be slightly riskier than the other. We don't know. Let's move on to screening, however, because I think we can prevent most of the TB in this setting. Jack mentioned the use of the IGRAs. The two available commercially are the T-spot TB and the uh, quantifuron assay. And they largely do the same thing. The uh, quantifuron assay does a, uh, uh, takes your lymphocytes and, and uh, counts how much lymphocyte production of interferon gamma there occurs in the face of TB antigen exposure. And the T-spot, rather than uh, counting the, or measuring the interferon gamma production, simply measures the number of cells that are reactive. They concord fairly well, and as far as I'm concerned clinically, uh, you can use them the same. You could spend hours talking about how these tests work in the setting of screening biologic therapy. And I'll just say that having done several systematic reviews and tried to do a meta-analysis, the data is so fragmented and so heterogeneous. There's so many studies out there of like 30 people and 50 people and 80 people, half of whom had AS and 20 of them had psoriasis. Mixed groups of people and they didn't test people systematically. So it's very difficult to understand how these, these assays work compared to the skin test necessarily in this setting. There's a few studies, though, I will highlight that I think give us some clues. And one is the study that was done by Ponce de Leon in Peru. And I really like this study because it was a, an RA study, but they had a control group. They had 100 RA patients, nearly 100 control groups. Both groups had high use of BCG, and both um, groups uh, were from Peru, where the background rate of TB, we think, or latent TB is about 60%. So they lined these people up. And note there was a high amount of prednisone use in the RA group, which of course was missing from the controls. And they found that the skin test reacted positive only 27% of the time in the RA group uh, as compared to 66% in the controls, which was expected. And then the quantifuron intube, that's a, the most recent generation of that assay, reacted 45% positive, uh, or the rate was 45% in the RA group and it was about 60% in the control group. So the take-home message was is the skin test seemed to be less sensitive than the quantifuron, and that almost double uh, the number of patients uh, mounted a positive quantifuron uh, response. Now, I can tell you I've reviewed that literature extensively, and I think my, my interpretation is, is that the IGRA is slightly more sensitive in this setting and probably other settings of immunosuppression. The T-spot might be slightly more sensitive than the, than the quantifuron, However, the quantifuron might be slightly more specific than the T-spot. So I probably would just put that in the back of your head and just say either one of them works, and they're probably more sensitive than the skin test. And I think the reason why they're more sensitive is I think they're less uh, dumbed down by prednisone as compared to the skin test. The prednisone certainly causes skin test energy. It does so probably for the IGRAs, but to a lesser extent. Uh, this is a study Jack published, and it really is a study that I thought was very important. And to me, is probably, there were, there were three studies published at the same time, and this was really the landmark study because it was the largest, the largest experience. It was an RCT where everyone was treated the same. It was, there was no heterogeneity. There were multiple disease groups studied, but there was huge numbers of RA patients, large numbers of AS patients. This was the golimumab uh, clinical trial development program and they published their TB screening results in actually two papers. And a couple things to point out here. Number one, um, in, oh, I don't know, Jack, what, over 2,000 some patient years, you had quite a bit of person year exposure. They had five cases of TB. Now, all these patients were screened with a dual screening strategy of baseline. They received a skin test and a quantifuron. And uh, patients that were positive and either could go into the trial, but they had to be treated with INH. So, they had five cases of TB in this entire clinical trial development experience. Interestingly, all of them had screened negative at baseline. Although when they looked at the results, two of them had probably what we would have caused positive, po called positive skin test results, but their countries didn't call them positive because they'd had BCG and the, the results weren't high enough. It was a 12 millimeter, they had BCG, so it didn't qualify. They'd like to see it 15 or above. We would have called that positive because it was above five. Uh, the bottom line is, they were deemed negative. In all five cases of TB, 
that developed were people that were failed to get picked up at uh, the start of the study. And this is pretty similar to other clinical trial experiences. It's not the people who screen positive who develop TB. It's the people who screen negative who go on to develop TB after they start their biologic. Uh, of the people that did screen positive, there are 317. All of them received INH, and none of them developed TB during the trial, speaking to the efficacy of screening and prophylaxis in this setting. What really bothered me about the results is this, and you can see these Venn diagrams here. B up here, this, this, is, a, this is the uh, BCG vaccinated group, and one might expect that there's little overlap of results in BCG vaccinees. I, the idea being the BCG is causing false positive skin tests, but, but does not affect the quantum furan, so one should see uh, some discordance. And in fact, here you have this group of 119 skin test positive, and there's 71 quantum furan positive, and very few of those, only 28 of them, were positive on both. What really bothered me about the study is this group here. This is group C. This is a non-BCG vaccinated strata. These people do not have BCG exposure. And you can see here that the overlap is just as poor. So most of the people that had a positive quantum furon did not have a positive skin test and vice versa. And they really didn't have any reason for this discordance because they didn't have a history of BCG. And when you look at this data and you look at data from uh, Xavier Mariette's study and several others published at the same time, there's this whole group of people with 15, 20 millimeter skin tests that end up with negative quantum furons or T-spots. That really bothers me. It's hard for me to blow off a 20 millimeter skin test, even though they have a negative uh, quantity. So there is this discordance issue out here. And, and probably the reason is, A, these tests just aren't that good. The skin test is 100 years old. It doesn't work that great. The new tests are better, but they still have shortcomings. We don't have the best tools to date. Our tools are getting better and better, but we still need better tools. So this has led me to um, propose the following screening algorithm. And I'll just take you through it really quickly. But the bottom line is, is the most important thing is to take a, a risk factor history. If you have risk factors, you go to this side of the diagram. And then I like to think about how immunosuppressed someone is. But no matter what you are, most of these people are immunosuppressed to some extent. If you have risk factors, you probably ought to screen people with a dual test strategy, a skin test and an IGRA. I think this is pretty straightforward. My example is the 60 uh, or the the 40 year old guy from the Philippines who was on 60 megs of preg, prednisone for his bichettes. He came to me. He, they wanted to put him on infliximab. I screened him. I did the, my algorithm. He was negative on both the IGRA and the skin test. And I said, okay, well you're negative, but you're from the Philippines, so you're probably positive. He said, why aren't my tests positive? I said, because they're not good tests, and you're on 60 milligrams of prednisone. He's like, well, what do we do? I said, well, let's test you again. So. I tested him again with an eye grade and it came back negative. So then I told him, all right, I guess you're not infected, but I actually think you probably are infected because you're from the Philippines. <laughs> and, and he said, well, I'm an engineer. Why don't you give me the number? So we, we, we spent like 30 minutes charting out the probabilities and skin tests, positive predictive value calculators, all that sort of stuff. And at the end of that, he's like, why don't you give me the INH? So I gave him the INH. He got off his prednisone. He went on his infliximab. And three months later, I tested him. His eye was positive. So this is an end of one experience. This is not a... How you, how you should live your life necessarily, but it illustrates how I think about these patients and you know, whether I believe my screening results or not. We're all doctors here. If you do a test and you don't get the result back that makes sense, you often repeat your test. So think about doing that uh, in those type of settings. The other side, I think, is also pretty straightforward. If you lack TB risk factors, you're like me from Oregon. You're, you're not at risk for anything except for rain and staph aureus. Um, you go down here, and you know, you're, if you're not immunosuppressed, let's say I got a little psoriasis on my elbow, then you know, you just do an IGRA, and I think you're done. If I had to pick one of the two tests, I'd pick an IGRA, slightly more sensitive, and I think it's slightly more specific. Um, it's this box here that bothers me. Uh, I think this is probably overkill, although I have proposed it, but it's, it's people without risk factors who are immunosuppressed, and I really don't feel that we can trust our tests. So I've, I've pitched the idea that you probably ought to perform a dual screening strategy with them as well. That would be backed up by the study Jack published, by Xavier Marias' study, the Kleinert study. Some of these studies have been done in, in patients and in zones of low TB endemicity where they have adopted dual screening approaches and they've had resulting very low rates of TB. I don't know, though. I think it's totally overkill, and I acknowledge that we'd end up probably treating more people than probably need be. But uh, I think we need a study to sort that out. So this was uh, just a pitch to the rheumatologist. It says, rheumatologists are smartest. And I know there's some GI people here. 
and some Durham people. Uh, this is G5 countries and non-G5 countries. This is in Europe. And this was a simple survey published as to whether these specialty groups uh, know and actually follow the TB recommendations with regards to screening prior to biologics uh, initiation. And it turns out the rheumatologists, there was a higher percentage of rheumatologists in each place that, uh, that are doing the right thing. And the, the percentages were lower for GI and, and Durham. But look at that. Durham beat the GI guys in the G5 countries. I was really surprised. I thought Durham wouldn't beat anybody. No. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, LTBI treatment. Let me give you the update here. I use a lot of rifampin. I'm almost done with INH. It's just it's nine months. Nobody wants to take it. There's the hepatotoxicity issue, which is pretty rare, but in older people on methotrexate, things like that, it's more common. Uh, I do use it, but I use a lot more rifampin. And in fact, in our TB control world, we've had a big INH shortage for the last year anyway. So a lot of us have drifted to using more rifampin because that's simply what we've been able to uh, obtain. Four months of rifampin is thought to be equivocal to nine months of INH. The only problem with rifampin is it interacts with a whole range of drugs, beta blockers, narcotics, blah, blah, blah. You got to watch that carefully. A lot of your patients are on drugs that that will interact with rifampin, and they may not be good candidates for rifampin. But every patient I have, I really sit down, and I think about that with them very closely to see which drug would benefit them more. If they don't have a lot of drug-drug interactions, I tend to go with rifampin, given a shorter course and less hepatotoxicity. Uh, Spain is really the only or place or study that's been published showing that if you uh, screen and then treat, you see a subsequent reduction in cases, and they published really the landmark paper in 2005 showing an 83% reduction in, in, in fliximab-associated cases after they adopted screening and treatment regimens prior to initiation. Uh, I already mentioned LFT testing with methotrexate. So now there's a new therapy option. Let me comment on it. Uh, this is called 12-IR or 3-IR, depends who you're talking to. Three months of isoniazid and rifapentine, or 12 weeks of isoniazid and rifapentine. Um, the key is it's once weekly. You take, for most of us in this room, it'd be basically nine pills, three INH pills and six rifapentine pills. So it's a big chunk of pills, nine pills, and you throw them down the hatch on Sunday, whatever your day of choice is, and then you repeat it once a week for 12 weeks. Now, the study was done in directly observed fashion, meaning the nurse met with you and watched you take your medicine. This was a study published in New England Journal last year, and it was uh, conducted by CDC, which, which of course is uh, my old agency, and it's, uh, it's a place where we're used to doing directly observed therapy. So the data shows that this regimen as compared to nine months of INH uh, was non-inferior. In fact, if you looked at the data, it was essentially more efficacious. And the rate of TB, this is the, the number of cases per patient year, it was 0.16 in the INH group and 0.07 uh, basically over over a 50% reduction in caseload and nearly met statistical significance. So the bottom line is it's as efficacious, if not more efficacious. The adverse event profile of this regimen was very similar to nine months of INH. Uh, I can tell you I've been using it more and more. Most people do not feel good around a day or two they take it, and I attribute it to the rifapentine elimination curve. People have fatigue and some nausea, and then they get over it. So there is, I think, a little bump from the rifapentine, but, but it's, uh, you know, it's dealable, something you can deal with. How about other biologics? Rituximab, we know about uh, mycobacterial cases of rituximab. Most all those people have been on prednisone or methotrexate. I'm not sure Rituxx causes uh, mycobacterial disease. Uh, abatacept, the rate 60 per 100,000 in the clinical trial program. I don't know if that's above uh, baseline or what's to be expected. They have screened in that clinical trial program. The tocilizumab, uh, you know, slightly higher rate in their development program. There's really only one population-based study that's looked at the rates of TB. And this is a Japan post-marketing surveillance study. The rate's pretty high, 220 per 100,000, but it's similar to the rate they see with their TNF blockers and about uh, 10 times above the, the background rate of TB in Japan. I like to look at animal data. It gives me some idea, at least in the absence of human data, what might be going on. And I, I don't have time to take you through all the studies other than to summarize each one. There's, there's at least one mouse study uh, where they knocked out B cells in mice and gave them TB, and they didn't do well. They actually died. And so it did speak to the importance of the B cell. The B cell is in granulomas. There's, those granulomas are macrophages and T cells and B cells and fibroblasts. It's one big snowball. Presumably, B cells have some important role to play. Uh, Abatacept, there is a, a murine chronic TB model that's been used to look at um, 
infection and, and the influence of Abatacept. And really, Abatacept did not influence the mouse's ability to contain their TB at all. Uh, and tocilizumab, a very similar study was done, and also showed the same thing. So really, from animals, uh, good evidence for TNF blockers causing TB worsening. There's maybe a, a suggestion of rituximab doing that. But with Abatacept and tocilizumab, there's, uh, it doesn't appear to affect a, a mouse's ability to control TB. Uh, my last few slides are on TOFA, and this is really some data we presented at ACR this year. Some of you may have seen it. It comes from the uh, developmental program from Pfizer, and this comes from the abstract that was presented. Uh, in their uh, clinical trial program, which really was conducted all around the world, the rate of TB was 173 per, per 100,000. There was a definite dose-dependent effect here that almost all these cases, I think there were 12 of them, 9 out of 12 occurred at the 10 milligram uh, BID dose as compared to the 5 milligram BID dose. And the rate was statistically significantly different. Uh, interestingly, like uh, Jack's uh, golumumab experience, everyone who developed TB in the trial had screened negative at start. Uh, mechanism of action, why would TOFA cause TB? Well, I have lots of ideas. We can talk about it later. But uh, it may hinder the macrophage's ability to control TB intracellularly, just like TNF blockers do. Uh, it also interferes with uh, interferon gamma signaling likely uh, through JAK uh, receptors, interferon type 1 and type 2. So here's the map of the world again. The darker areas are where the TB occurs in the world. And the darker, there's some red dots here somewhere. I'm colorblind. I can't see them. But the bottom line is almost all the, the TB cases that occurred in the TOFA trials occurred in areas of uh, fairly high endemicity. So what I did was I figured out where they did their trials. And we divided them up into low, medium, and high endemic ranges. So low was, was less than 10 per 100,000, like here in Western Europe. Medium was between 10 and 50 per 100,000. And then high was above 50 per 100,000. So most of Asia uh, fell into that category. And the rates were uh, about 35 per 100,000 in the low and medium range, which is you know, a little bit higher than uh, background. Uh, and the rates were 781 per 100,000 in uh, highly endemic areas. So probably elevated, definitely elevated fivefold or something uh, in those regions. I think this is really important. What they did in their trial and what we described in the, the poster was that they, they screened everyone prior to entry. And if they screened positive either by history of, yeah, I had LTBI, I was never treated, or if they had a positive skin test result or quantifiron, they used either one. Um, they were allowed entry into the trial if they started INH, they were compliant for a month, and then they went on to TOFA. And of the 209 people treated that way, not one of them developed TB, which I think was, was important to note. Also, no one had hepatotoxicity, which is also important, because there's TOFA and IL-6. I mean, there's all these drugs out there now that, that uh, you see rises in liver enzymes in a subset of patients. And uh, there seemed to be no interaction with um, isoniazid in this regard. This is really important here, though. If you, if you end up using TOFA or you know, trying to uh, treat someone for TB while they go on to TOFA, you can't use rifampin. And that needs to get out there, that message. There is a drug-drug interaction with rifampin and TOFA. Uh, I think rifampin diminishes TOFA's efficacy, and I think it probably goes both ways. Uh, and I don't know that we know for sure, but I know they interact. So I wouldn't use rifampin. It's really an INH uh, endeavor. Lastly, uh, Jack already mentioned it, NTM, non-TB mycobacterium, is near and dear to my heart. Most of this is M. avium or uh, M. intracellular, or the complex known as MAC, of course. And the second group of bugs coming up are the rapid growers, primarily mycobacterium obsessus, we're seeing more and more of. Uh, but the rates, this is from Kaiser, Northern California, which is a beautiful population. It's 3.2 million people. Ethnically, it matches uh, the diversity of the U.S. extraordinarily well. It's very generalizable to the U.S. with regards to their TB risk. And you can see we looked at uh, the general population here, and we calculated TB risk and NTM risk. And you can see, I'll just take you through it. Uh, in the general background population, the risk of TB was 2.8 per 100,000. NTM was 1.5 or almost two times higher, 4.1 per 100,000. If you look at uh, old people, <laughs> just kidding, older people, uh, over the age of 50, you see the rates jump to 5.2 per 100,000 and 11.8 per 100,000. If you look at RA patients who are unexposed to TNF blockers, the rates go up again, 8.7 per 100,000 for TB. And again, over double for NTM, 19.2 per 100,000. 
And then if finally, if you looked at the RA patients who had uh, started a TNF drug, you saw rates of 56 per 100,000 for tuberculosis, and you saw rates of NTM, again, double that, 105 per 100,000. So pretty clearly, uh, to me, in the U.S. at least, NTM is much more common uh, in this setting than TB. It's something that is being diagnosed more and more, not just uh, in, in the general population, but also in RA, where there is underlying lung disease that puts patients at risk for pulmonary NTM. And then the drugs being used probably elevate that risk further. Uh, and that's what we want to avoid. This is my lady with uh, MAI, cavitary MAI, who went right down the tubes and uh, died, unfortunately, when she had her TNF system blocked. Uh, despite being um, on adequate antimicrobial therapy. As Jack mentioned, this is uh, often a non-curable entity, unlike TB. So uh, it's one to tread very carefully with if you encounter. Uh, I think that's it. Thanks. I'm happy to take your questions. I want to thank Len for having me uh, out to Cleveland. Thanks, Len.